Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I'd like to just say some introductory comments before I start uh, my dars. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So um, I, I know they mean really well when they say that you need to respect my time and all of that. Um, I have had a policy since I began public speaking, going to conventions, programs, doing my own programs, visiting masajid. And I don't see any reason to change that policy anytime soon. And that policy is that um, I, I can be doing what I do. My primary, I, I suppose my primary contribution is to um, record whatever I've come to learn and to be able to produce a resource that you can access later on. Um, and so I don't actually have that, that purpose is not served by me coming to a community like yours. I can do that sitting at home. I can do that at my own campus. But when I do come here, um, it's actually for selfish reasons. And, and my selfish reason is, I get to have interaction with as many Muslims as possible, get to hear some of your questions, your concerns, not only related to my lecture. So I was saying that when I do come, it's an opportunity for me to interact with you and actually, um, you know, a lot of times I'm having a conversation with one of you, brother, sister, child, whoever, and then somebody jumps in and says salam, and then the other conversation kind of gets left off, and it's, it's difficult for me. I actually have social dyslexia as a result of lots of engagement with large crowds of the public, and that's because normally you're having a conversation with one person and you don't get interrupted, right? But I'm in, the, I'm in this line of work where I can't actually have that. I'm in the middle of a conversation with you, somebody sticks a salam in, the, in my face and puts their hand out and I have to say wa alaikum as salam and another conversation just got cut off. Now from the other person's point of view, if I don't respond to their salam, then I'm being rude. And the, the first person who was talking to me just felt like I was being rude by responding and giving salam because I just discontinued a conversation. Oh, he doesn't care about me. He's got too many people following him. So he just, you know, I just tried to talk to him and I just became unimportant. All of you are important to me, all of you. And because Muslims are important to each other. And, you know, if, if any of you are benefiting from the work that I'm doing, then every second that you might listen to something I say, and as a result of that, some khair comes in your life, may Allah overlook many of my mistakes in my durus or otherwise, if you get some benefit out of that, I'm getting akhirah commission. So I'm getting like rich with Allah off of you, right? So I owe you a lot, in fact. So you might think that I, my time is valuable. Actually, you've given me much of your valuable time when you're commuting at work or whether I'm helping you go to sleep every night, whatever it is, right? So, so I, I do respect, I, I actually really value having a chance to have a conversation with you. My request from all of you is that if you do, would like to have a conversation with me, first, let me give you some advice. Don't tell me you've heard a lot of my lectures. Don't tell, because you know what that does? It just makes you nervous. I've talked to enough of you to know this already. Osama, oh, I've seen so many of your videos, like so many. Oh my God, I've seen all of them. Okay. Because if you hadn't seen all of them, what, would I, what was I going to say? Oh, you haven't seen all of them? Next. <laughs> it's okay. I get it. Totally get it. Actually, first of all, don't be nervous. And a lot of times guys come up to me and even brothers and sisters, they come up to me. I had so many questions, but I'm forgetting all of them right now. And I'm like, I, I, I'm trying not to be intimidating, but I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I would love to get your questions. Absolutely, I would love to get your questions. I would, I would love to have a chance, even if I don't get to answer you directly, it'll probably become the subject of a khutbah or a lecture that I do uh, later, because if you have a concern, there's probably a million other Muslims that have a similar concern. And maybe Allah has something to say about that. I might find that and it might be of benefit to you and so many others. So it actually is a good deed for you also that you pointed me in a certain direction. The, the Prophet ﷺ told us the one who points someone in a good direction gets the reward of the one who does the right, the good thing. If you gave somebody directions to the masjid, they went to the masjid and they prayed, you get the reward of their prayer too, just because you gave them directions. That's So we have this partnership actually, 
right? So I'm not in any position of, you know, celebrity or superiority of any kind over you. We're just in any minal muslimin. The Quran says anybody who calls to Allah should declare I'm among the Muslims. So uh, I don't accept the title of Shaykh, obviously, because I'm not one. I'm, I'm very far from that. Um, I don't accept the title of scholar. I am definitely a researcher, a serious student. I consider myself a serious student. Uh, I do work with scholars. Um, and I would love to hear from you, uh, you know, questions regarding the Quran, other things that if I can help, I'll certainly try to help. If it's a long, drawn out question, then I'll try to maybe, uh, you know, get your contact information or say, hey, I'm going to work on this. Let me write it down. So I actually keep notes in my phone specifically for these kinds of conversations. Right. So I would love to hear from you and I don't want to rush off. I'm here. Uh, I'm at your service. And in fact, my history is this. I would go to conventions. They give me a speech. They give me, you know, they give you time, right? And all the speakers, none of the speakers respect the time. You know that, right? I have five more minutes. 15 minutes later, I have five more minutes. 30 minutes later, I have five more minutes. And in the end, I would like to say two hours later. And in the end, I would like to say, but I actually try to respect the time that they give me. So I'll spot, if, if anything, three, four minutes over, I'll ask permission, do it. Because they actually, they have a shot clock kind of time for a lot of they, they, It's looking, staring at you. And it literally says leave. And when it's done, like you guys don't see that. We see that, right? So, but anyway, when I do leave, you know, you meet people in the audience, you meet people in the bazaar, and usually I ended up staying at conventions, conferences, lectures, talks, even my own programs until two in the morning just because people want to talk. And some people get frustrated, they don't get a turn to chance to talk to me. Because even if I gave one minute to one person, 50 people later, somebody had to wait 50 minutes, right? So that's a lot of time to wait. And they have kids, they have family, they have work to get back to, other things. So uh, I would ask that you guys be courteous of each other. I would ask that you, uh, you do take the opportunity to in, in educate me about things that are concern, of, of concern to you. I love getting educated by you. I love getting to learn, and I, I, don't, I don't claim that I have your answers, but at least now I'm aware of the question. So I can maybe ask those who know better than me. And maybe I can become a medium to maybe try and get you that answer, inshallah ta'ala. Right? So that's, that's my, my uh, humble request to you. The other, because I'm, I've taken that tangent already, might as well address one more thing. There are some, many of you are going through a, a, a delicate family situation. Right? So whether it's in your marriage or it's involving your children or involving your parents or involving inheritance or a death in the family or some complicated situation with your uncle, your chacha, your mamu, your what, you know, somebody. And there's a, there's a complex situation and you need an answer for that situation, right? And if you would like my unfiltered opinion, a lot of times the answer is not, you're thinking that the answer will come from somebody knowledgeable in deen. But that might be only a portion of the answer a huge portion of that answer might actually have to do with the law. Um, and I, or another huge portion might have to actually have to do with psychology and counseling. And th there may be other components, not just the Islamic component that you need to address or understand. So getting somebody to tell you what the, the, the Quran says or what the Messenger of Allah says وسلم, may not be as easily applicable as you might think. There are other factors that you may not be considering. So it would be irresponsible of me to say, well, the ayah says this. And then you go home and dish, you, you go nuclear at home because the ayah says something, you know, because that's not how it's applied. It's, it's a very delicate case-by-case -case type situation. And I'm most certainly not a counselor. I'm absolutely not a counselor. And you must engage that service. There are people that are licensed, they've put thousands of hours into that work to understand those delicate nuances. Uh, and if you are going to seek counsel, my advance, my, my, my first request would be seek counsel from those that are licensed and have, are deeply trained in the field of counseling. Because it is, it is a sensitive, you, just like you wouldn't go to a cardiologist just because the guy has a good heart. You, know, <laughs> you gotta, <laughs> you know, it's a two different things. Right, so this is, this is certainly a science by itself, and it, it has an Islamic component, but only a component. And another huge part of it actually has to do with mental health, has to do with counseling and other, other factors. So please be mindful of that for your own good. 
Uh, and don't be naive in thinking just because some brother who knows deen more than you or sister who knows deen more than you, they're ready to counsel you on your delicate family situation. They may not understand things about teen psychology and communication psychology and you know, all, there's so many other things. So anyway, that's a, that's a side note. So let's begin our dars inshallah ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أما السفينة فكانت لمساكين يعملون في البحر فأردت أن أعيبها وكان وراءهم ملك يأخذ كل سفينة غصبا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد once again everyone assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh today i start speaking with you about ayah number 79 where khadir alayhi salam is going to start giving musa alayhi salam the background you know information knowledge of what was really going on behind the acts that he committed the first act was he was on a ship boarding along with Musa salam, with some men that were on there and he goes to the bottom deck and starts ripping out its planks until the, the, the ship starts getting flooded and it's going to capsize and they have to come back to shore. Now the Quran will not give you explicit long-winded details. It will be brief in the way it tells a story and you, you know they say in Urdu they say Akalman ke liye ishara kafi hai. In Arabic they say Allabibu min al isharati yafhamu. The intelligent person can take a hint. What the Qur'an does a lot of times in the way it tells a story, it does not give you every single explicit detail. It points to certain things and you can fill in the gaps yourself, right? There's a brevity, brevity for those of you who don't know has nothing to do with bravery, it means briefness, right? So it's, there's a brevity in the style of Qur'anic storytelling. But that brevity doesn't mean that the Qur'an is missing details, the Qur'an is expecting the listener to fill in gaps. So actually the Qur'an expects its audience to be thinkers. It, it actually expects this. It doesn't expect you to just take something at face value and leave the gaps be. It wants you to fill in those gaps. And it's actually a, a way of the Qur'an raising the intelligence and the intellectual and the analytical capacity of its listener and of the one who's contemplating on it. Anyway, so he's now going to talk about the ship. That was the first incident, Amma Safina. So he's going back and he's starting from incident one to two to three. And we're only gonna talk about incident one today. So he says, here are his words, first let's translate them. فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ So the ship, it actually was the property of, that's one way to translate that, the property of some poor folks, masakina, so, or helpless folks, you can even consider that masakin can be translated, helpless folks, يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ that used to work in the sea. So they were fishermen or they dove for pearls, whatever they did, but they were working in the sea and that's why they owned a, a, a ship. فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِبَهَا Thus, so they were, they were poor and they worked in the sea, so they don't make a lot of money, they barely get by, basically, right? And then he says, فَأَرَدْتُ Then I intended أَنْ أَعِبَهَا to damage it. I intended to damage it. Aib actually means a fault or a flaw. So I needed to create a flaw or a fault in the ship. So it's faulty, so it doesn't function anymore. I wanted to make the ship dysfunctional. Aratu an aibaha. Wakana wara'ahum malikun. And this is, I'm going to give you a shallow translation before we dive in. And behind them, there was a king. A king was behind them. Wakana wara'ahum malikun. What, what about that king? King يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا That was grabbing on to every ship forcefully. He was seizing every ship forcefully. It's called commandeering. The, I think the English term is commandeering. Right? Sometimes in emergency situations, the police might commandeer your vehicle. Or the, the military might commandeer somebody's home. Right? And here you have a naval you know, expanse, and this king has declared some state of emergency and he needs to immediately expand his naval capacity. So he's taking whatever ships that are there that the public has, and he's commandeering them for his naval, whatever uh, mission that he has, right? For his, for, his, uh, for his expedition. So this is the background. That's the only thing he says about the ship. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this analysis from, uh, from Khadir alayhi salam, and I'll say a couple of introductory comments that go back to the hadith uh, that talks about this story. Musa alayhi salam was the recipient of the Torah. Khadir alayhi salam is the recipient of something Allah calls 
وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا We've given him some special kind of knowledge that comes especially from us. Some great knowledge, عِلْمًا رُبَّمَا لِلتَّفْخِيمِ لِلتَّعْظِيمِ It could be for magnification, some great knowledge that comes only from us. So there's the knowledge of revelation, and there's the special kind of knowledge given to Khadr Now the words of Khadr in the hadith are kind of important. He makes a tamthil, and he makes a parable between the knowledge of Musa, which is the knowledge of Torah, and the knowledge that he's been given, and he looks at a bird that picks, uh, pecks its beak into the sea a couple of times. And he says, what you have been given and what I have been given are nukra or nukratain. They are just a drop from the sea compared to the knowledge of Allah. Compared to the knowledge of Allah. So what's he saying? The magnificent book of Allah, Torah, which was enough for prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to not even get a new revelation, to only reinforce Torah. It's a magnificent book of Allah. That book in its entirety counts for what? A drop from the revelation, the wisdom that Allah Azza wa Jal could give. It's a drop. And on the other side, whatever Khadr knows, whatever Khadr knows is only what? A drop. So he actually doesn't know all of the keys to the unseen. He doesn't know the entire ocean. He only knows what? A drop. Now the, the analogy of a drop is really interesting. Because a drop, liquid, a drop is inseparable from other drops in the sea until you pluck it out. Right? So the drops are completely fused with one another and indistinguishable from each other until you pluck one out. Right? So even though his is just a drop, other things are connected to it that he doesn't know about. Other things are connected to it. Now, let's think about that for a moment. Let's, let's dive deep a little bit. He says, first of all, as for the ship, it belonged to a bunch of poor people. Masakin. Masakin in Arabic is different from fuqara. Uh, the, I'm sure you're familiar with the word fuqara. Fuqara actually comes from the word faqr, which means the back to be broken. Faqara or iftaqara in Arabic is when someone has so much burden on their back that their back is, the, the, the back creaks and it makes snapping sounds. Some of you that work out might pull a back muscle when you know deadlifting or something incorrectly or squatting incorrectly and you involved your back in it and it can, it can hurt your back. Some might, some might even you know, injure their back severely when they're playing you know, more rigorous sports like football or rugby or something like that, right? So the, the, and, and the back is one of the smallest or the, the, the most powerful muscles in our entire body. It's a large muscle. So breaking the back, it takes a lot to break the back. It's easy to break a pinky. It's easy to snap, you know, or, or, or you know, get, get injured in your toe or something like that. The extremities, but the larger muscles are harder to injure, right? So the breaking of the back means someone's completely, completely overwhelmed. Where they couldn't, you know, they couldn't uh, uh, hold the capacity of the load and they become incapable and that's, thus they become fuqara. So the faqir, most mufassirun say, or fuqaha even say faqir, man laysa lahu shay. Man laysa lahu, he has nothing. The guy has nothing, completely, absolutely bankrupt would be a faqir, nothing to his name, okay? And then they say, they make a distinction between that and miskin. you've heard the word miskin before, right? In the ayah of the recipients of sadaqat, the recipients of zakah, Allah makes a distinction between al-fuqara wal masakin. He separates the two. or So because they're mentioned together, that means they mean two different things. So sometimes we say, oh, this is a miskin, this is a faqir. We use that interchangeably. But the Quran seems to have made a distinction between the miskin and the faqir. So what is that distinction? Some ulama comment on this. They say the miskin, lahu uh, shay, he's got something. Lahu ma yamlik, wa la yakfihi. He owns something, but it's not enough for him. He owns something, but it's not enough for him. He's a taxi driver, he's got a car, he's making some money, but it's not enough to pay the rent. It's not enough to pay the electricity. It's not enough for the groceries. So it's not like he owns nothing, but whatever he does own isn't enough to get by. That would be a miskin. It's, it's barely enough or it's not enough at all. That would be a miskin. Now, uh, Imam Alusi rahimahullah really didn't like that definition. So he actually tried to vehemently in his tafsir oppose this definition of miskin and say no. Because in this ayah there's kind of a fiqhi kind of offshoot debate that happened among the mufassirun. Because it says, فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ They were masakin, they were miskin, working in the sea. 
they're working in the sea. Now, why is that important? First of all, let me give you the etymology. I told you about faqr, breaking back. Let's talk about miskeen. These are ruba'i, they are four letter roots. So you, you might have heard, even if you don't know Arabic, many Arabic words, the speaker talks about three letters that, that are in the root. Like ilm is, ayn, lam, and meme are the roots, right? So miskeen is actually a four letter root. Meme, seen, kaf, and noon. So it's actually maskana, or tamaskana, yatamaskanu. It can come from that too, right? And the ruba'iyat, the four letter roots, there's a really good theory that the four letter roots are actually a fusion of two three letter roots. So like for example, you have in the Quran, Ba'thara, Ba'thara, which is four letters, Ba'in, Tha, and Ram. Idha quburu Bu'thirat. So the scholars of etymology of the Judur will say this is Ba'tha and Athara together. Ba'tha and Athara fused and became Ba'thara. Miskeen is Masaka and Sakana together. So it's actually Masaka, which means to stop, and similar or withhold, like amsaka, and then sakana is to, to, to pause. And from it they derive kind of a, a, the root analysis of this word. And they basically suggest, I'll put it in simple words, you know when someone is stopped, that's one because they got tired or they needed to get rest, that's why our homes where we get our rest are called sakan, right? Or maskan also. And when you're completely at rest, you're in a state of sakina. And when your the Jaweed was mentioned before we started, when you pause at a letter, it's called a sukoon, right? And when the animal is slaughtered, it stops moving because you use a sikin on it, right? The sikin, the knife, is called a sikin because it pauses the animal, it stops it from moving. So the word sakana is for stopping. But masaka actually has to do with withholding. So the, if you combine the two, and where do you get, what's the logic behind the word miskeen? Somebody's no longer able to move, you know, uh, to move. Or somebody's no longer able to get out of their situation. They stopped, they, the car ran out of gas, for example. The car stopped. Sakanat. Right, it, it came to a pause. And now the guy doesn't have money, doesn't have a gas station nearby, doesn't have any resources. So it's being, he's being held in that helpless state. That's masaka on top of sakana. So not only did you run out, and you came to a stop, you came to a halt, now you're, you're stuck in that situation. So to give you a real life example, somebody only makes money by driving an Uber or something, right? They're driving a taxi or an Uber. And then their eyesight goes away, right? So now the only means of income they had, they can't do anything about it. They lost their license, and now they can't get any other work because the, the, the means of their income was their ability to see, right? So that's, that, that person becomes a miskeen. So, miskeen is different from faqir. Faqir has nothing. But the miskeen, according to this ayah, is interesting. Masakina ya'maluna fil bahar. They're masakin, but they work in the sea. So, they have a job or no? They have a job. A faqir may not even have a job. But the Quran gave a broader definition of a miskeen in these ayat. What's the broader definition? Somebody could be in a very bad financial situation, very bad family situation, very bad residential situation, even though they have a means of making money. You know what happens sometimes? You say, this guy, these people on the street, they make a lot of money, I don't have to give them anything. Oh, why are you giving this guy a tip? You know everybody gives them a tip, don't, you know. So you look at somebody like working in a restaurant or something and running around, you know, and you see an old man working like, working at a grocery store or something. Nah, they have a job. You don't know how much they get. You, you assume that they're doing all right. Plus they even have a job. Why are you worried about that? What is the Quran pointing at? A kind of sensitivity we wouldn't have. This person is not begging you on the street. He's not a sa'il. But he could be a miskeen. Because they're in this job. Imagine, sometimes you see people working in the grocery store. Muslim or not isn't even the issue. You see people working in the grocery store that are older than some of your parents. You see that. And the thought doesn't come to us, man, how much would it hurt me to see my father standing here? How much would it hurt me to see my mom standing at the grocery store aisle? Sometimes you see grandmas checking you out at the, at the cash register. And she's standing there for 8-10 hours. When your mom is standing for 5 minutes to make you a roti, you say, Amiji, bajan, bajan, bajan. Right? You have this like, oh mom, sit down, relax. Your back's gonna hurt. That's also somebody's grandma. That's also an old woman. She might be in a state of maskana. Right? So the idea, just, just because somebody has a job, they can't be miskeen is kind of broken here. And it doesn't have to be they're old. Are these young men or old men? They're probably young men that are fishing. 
Limasakin. So you don't have to be a certain age category to be miskeen. The Quran is actually uh, making the believer sensitive to people in desperate situations even when they're not posting their desperate situation online. Even when they're not wearing a poster or holding a sign that says, feed me or help me with my rent. Because that's the most humiliating thing, right? So even another place in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah talked about some of the Sahaba who were very self-respecting people, but they sacrificed everything in their loyalty to the Prophet wasallam. And Allah says about them, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الَّذِينَ أُحْسِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ the, for, the, for those who are faqeer, now what did I say about faqeer? They own something or own nothing? They own, they're even worse than miskeen. They're even in a tougher situation than miskeen. And they have been encircled because they took the path of Allah. Because they took Allah's path, they lost everything. الَّذِينَ أُحْسِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And what does Allah say about those people? Allah says about these people, لَا يَسْأَلُونَ النَّاسَ إِلْحَافًا they don't wrap themselves around the legs of people like a blanket begging for money. Because you know, there's an ancient culture of when people saw wealthy, the young, the, the beggar kids or beggars, they would come and they would grab at the feet of those that have money. Some of you have traveled to Muslim countries where people do that. Even now, Allah says, these are not the kind of people that are going to come and beg you. لَا يَسْأَلُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْحَافًا تَعْرِفُهُمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ You're going to recognize them by the look on their faces, by their foreheads, by the mark of stress and anxiety on their face. You came to the masjid, some guy is praying next to you, and you should just be able to tell they have an anxiety. You don't even know the person, but they have an anxiety. And you'll come over and say, is everything okay? Because they're not going to come, brother, can I borrow $10? Because they're going to shut down my water and electricity and I don't have enough to pay. They're not going to say that. They're not going to, you have to have the sensitivity to, to, to see that in people. In the ayah, Allah says, يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُ أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ The ignorant one will think these people have no need. They're okay. I saw them. They, uh, they even came to the masjid. The guy had a shirt. If he can afford a shirt, he's doing all right. It's not like his clothes are ripped. You know what? What we do is we assume that people are okay. Just because they didn't beg. And Allah says people who make that kind of assumption without any sensitivity are actually jahil. In the ayah they're jahil. So now coming back to this ayah, Khadr salam is telling Musa salam, first of all these people were miskeen. In other words they were barely making ends meet. If, or if not even making ends meet. And the only inkling of hope they had of making a kind of income is the ship. Alusi rahimahullah says, no, a miskeen probably doesn't own anything either. So he had a problem with fakanat li masakin, lamil milkiya, lamil milk. Right, so they, one translation is, they owned the ship. He said, no, this lam is not al milkiya, it could be that the ship was at their service, they were renting it or some other person owned it. So he tried to do kind of this uh, analysis of this and then he even came up with I don't know where he got it from probably maybe some athar that I didn't get to yet he says that there were 10 of them 5 of them were paralyzed or they were disabled in some way and the other 5 were working and the aggregate group was called masakin so you have to be impaired in some way to be called a miskin. so you really held on to that view but the lahir the obvious of the ayah is actually they were just poor that's, that's clearly stated and they were still working so one of the side benefits from this ayah is that just because people have a job doesn't mean they're not miskeen, doesn't mean they're not stuck. You know there are people that can be working, working hard, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day for 20, 30 years and not have any savings, live hand to mouth, right? You get, you get people not far from here, I saw it myself, we used to be like that. My family used to be like that and when, when people live in New York, the guy, guy's got a little corner shop in like Astoria or somewhere or in Jamaica or somewhere else and he's selling hats or scarves or t New York t-shirts. I love New York, let me tell you, he don't love no New York. But he's selling those t-shirts and you know, he's working there for 20 years and he still has, still barely making rent at the apartment, barely saving anything to put his kids through an education, nothing, right? And they, 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 they struggle that way for years and years and years. Right? So they, that would be an example of someone who's what? Miskeen. I landed in LaGuardia and it was like 11.30 at night and there's a long list of cabs back then before Uber. Long list of cabs and they're trying to get a customer, right? And my hotel was right across from LaGuardia. So it was a two minute drive. And you can tell this guy has been waiting to get a customer for like an hour. 
right? And, if, and then I got in his car, he's a Muslim guy, I got in his car, and he said, where are you going? I was like, right there. And he just, he took this breath, like, because <sighs> he knew he was going to get like four bucks out of this ride, right? Because he waited an hour, hour and a half to get his turn, and you know, somebody wants to go to Long Island, at least it'll be worth it. Oh, somebody wants to go to Jersey, somebody wants to go to uptown, wherever, the Bronx, it'll be, he'll get something out of it. This guy's, you know, using his gas money, staying away from home, 12.30 at night, and he's going to get four dollars out of this wait. He probably spent more in gas just running the car, right? So when I saw him just take a breath, my heart sank, like I didn't want to say anything. So I just started talking to them, because you know they have the name in the back? So I was like, your name's Muhammad, he said, yeah, my name's Muhammad. And we start talking, how many kids do you have, this and that. We start making conversation. And then, you know, two minutes later, I'm at my hotel. Zakallah khairan, brother Muhammad. And I, I gave him $40, right? And he said, well, I was like, this is for your kids, and it's not for you. Because Eid is coming, right? This is Eid gift for you. And I tell you, kid you not, the brother started crying. And he begged me to take it back. I was like, no, you don't take a gift back. Raji'u fi hibatihi, karraji'u fi qayihi, karraji'u fi qayihi. Giving back, a, the one who takes back a gift is the same person as uh, someone who takes back vomit. I can't take it back, haram alayya, right? But you know what, when you can, you don't have to like, hey, are you in a bad economic situation? Therefore, maybe I should give you a bigger, don't mention it. No, you should just be sensitive to somebody's circumstance and try to develop that kind of little bit of courtesy towards others, right? You guys go to a restaurant and you go, you're the last customer there. Right, and they're, they're closing up shop. And there's people that work there, that have been working there all day. And first of all, you're not going to leave a tip. And second of all, you're going to make a huge mess. And these people want to get home, and you're just staying there, staying there, staying there. And you can see they're older, they're, you know, at least teach your kids to help with them. And leave them a kind note, something. If you can't give sadaqah of money, qawlun ma'rufun. Some, some good word is also sadaqah. Right? Al-basmatu fi wajhi akhika sadaqah. You could smile in the face of your brother, that's sadaqah, right? So we, this, this is the kind of sensitivity that we have to develop. Anyway, there was no way for Musa to know that these people are poor, apparently. Another interesting lesson, because Musa would have picked up on it, right? He's sensitive to situations, like he was at Madian when he saw those girls in need of help. So even he couldn't pick up on the fact that they're masakin, he had to be told. Another lesson in that is, maybe a person looks totally normal and they're still not okay. You cannot judge what a person is going through just by their appearance, right? You know, when a, when, a, when a kettle is boiling and it's really, really hot, unless you hear it, you can't tell that it's scorching hot and you might touch it and you find that it's extremely hot. The cold one and the burning hot one look exactly the same, right? So don't judge just by appearance and don't judge, you look at someone, they look fine, they're fine. How do you know they're fine? How do you know there's not a storm going on inside their minds? Right, so he, now Khadir Ali Sam is telling him, فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ It was for, so the, the sequence is really interesting. So as for the ship, it belonged to poor people that were working in the sea. Good enough. فَأَرَدْتُ أَنَعِيبَهَا So I intended to damage it. That doesn't answer the question, it makes it worse. <laughs> like, wait. Yeah, I'm going to explain to you why I did this. They were really poor, so I destroyed their livelihood. <laughs> so it builds up even more like, huh? Because this is actually called tashwiq. He wanted to build up the scene before he actually gives the rationale. You would imagine he would first say, by the way, there was a king. He was grabbing all, all the ships. That's why I damaged it. So that that's why I damaged it should have gone at the end, expected at the end. But before he even gets to the reason, before that, he puts it in the unexpected place. But unexpected from the human point of view. From the human point of view, they were poor, and you damaged their ship? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. But from Allah's point of view, which is being taught to Khadr and now he's teaching it, because they were poor, they were given the favor of damaging the ship. They were, they were, their livelihood was, dis, was damaged because they were poor. That's actually, they, it has awlawiyah, it has priority in the ayah, even over the king. In other words, saving them from the king is secondary, looking out for them, doing a favor to them to, by Allah's primary. From it we learn a profound lesson. It's an absolutely profound lesson. Sometimes Allah will plan a financial setback for you. 
a, the loss of a job, the tanking of a business. Allah will, 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 will set you back the loss of your degree or your inability to pay for school or whatever else. There's some hurdle will come in your way that will set you back. And it will be a traumatic experience. Out of nowhere, they're, they're, they already got worries. They're masakeen, so they're worried about enough food for one day. And now they're worried about being killed because they might drown in, at sea. And they somehow make it back to shore. And then they're worried about, okay, forget it. Our livelihood is gone for good. Where are we going to get our risk now, right? So worry on top of worry, on top of worry. And yet all of that is a favor for, from Allah. فَأَرَدْتُ أَنَ عِبَهَا So I intended to damage it. وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكٌ And behind them there was a king. Now the word wara led to an interesting discussion. Some of us say wara means in front of them. Meaning if they kept going forward, they would have run into the, the naval, you know, the, the, the seizure group that, that checks on all the boats and just takes them. Others take the more literal meaning of wara, which is behind. Wara actually, the, 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 the use that's sha'i' that's common in the Arabic language is wara means behind, right? But they say, well, how could it be behind? Because it's the naval ship, they would have caught him so quickly. But Ibn Ashur has a really nice comment on it, so I'll read that for you and translate. وَوَرَاءَ إِسْمُ الْجِهَةَ الَّتِي خَلْفَ ظَهْرٍ ظَهْرِ مَنْ أُضِيفَ إِلَيْهِ ذَلِكَ الْإِسْمِ Wara is used for the direction of someone who is behind you that it's attributed. So wara'i meaning right behind me. وَهُوَ ضِدُّ أَمَامَ وَقُدَّامَ It's the opposite of in front of. وَيُسْتَعَارُ الْوَرَاءِ لِحَالِ تَعَقُّبِ شَيْءٍ شَيْئًا وَحَالَ مُلَازَمَةِ طَلَبِ شَيْءٍ شَيْئًا بِحَقٍ وَحَالِ الشَّيْءِ أَلَّذِي سَيَأْتِي قَرِيبًا So basically, this is also istiara. Remember I said istiara yesterday? You borrow a term. When someone is wara of me, it means they are behind me and they are about to catch up to me. Like Allah says, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ جَهَنَّمُ مِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ جَهَنَّمُ Meaning, right behind them is Jahannam, meaning it's about to catch up to them. Right? You know how they say, the cops are on my back. The cops are on my back means they're about to what? Catch up to me. That's istiara. They're not on your back, but they're about to catch up to you. So wara behind is being used here as the king is on the verge of capturing their, their, their ship. They don't even realize it, he's on the verge of getting to it. They can't even see him on the horizon, they don't know this initiative has been, been launched. This is maybe a last second initiative from the king, and the king doesn't care to see who's worthy, who's not worthy, is it injustice, is it not injustice. The king just issued a verdict, if there's a ship and it's working, I want it here. But should we take it from, I don't care, just bring me the ships. That's it. Now, how do we know the king is ruthless? Because he says, Malikun يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ He's grabbing every ship. So he doesn't discriminate. He just wants all of them. But then the word added, adds a, a layer of dhulm, actually. غَصْبًا يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا That's the word at the end of the ayah. غَصْبًا is the hal here. And actually, غَاصِبًا would be ex expected. Because a hal, I know I'm getting grammar geeky with you, but a hal should be an ism fa'il. غاصباً. But غصباً is a mustar. One day you will understand this and it will feel really good, I promise you. You will understand. Make dua to Allah that Allah makes the learning of the language of the Qur'an easy for you. So you can taste its beauty, so you can enjoy its words. So غصباً is a mustar, which makes it a mubalagha. It's a, it's a kind of mubalagh language. What that means in simple English is this. It means, by, by the way, let me tell you about غصب. Then I'll translate. غصبت الجلدة إِذَا كَدَتْتُ عَنْ شَعْرِهِ أَوْ وَبَرِهِ قَصْرًا بِلَا عَطًا فِي الدِّبَاغ وَلَا إِعْمَالٍ فِي نَدًا هُوف نَزْعُ الشَّيْءِ مِنْ مُنْتَبِهٍ أَوْ مَقَرٍ بِغِلْضٍ أَوْ قَهْرٍ أَوْ قَهْرٍ Basically, you know, when you, you could shave hair. You could shave hair. You can also pluck hair, right? Like waxing or threading or something, right? Uh, men don't know about that, alhamdulillah. Women may know something about waxing and they bear all kinds of pain for you know, whatever purposes. I didn't know about threading, I didn't know what that was. I went to a Turkish barber in Long Island and he's like, uh, wax, uh, thread, thread? I was like, I don't know what he's saying. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, and I, I don't know, he, just, I, he finished giving me my haircut and he's like, he's touching my cheek like this. I'm like, what's he gonna do with my cheek? And then he took out a string and he went ding, 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 like a guitar. And then he put the string over here and he went Pruh! And my life flashed before my eyes. My cheek turned tomato red. And I was like, ah! 
and before I could say stop, he was done on the other side too. <laughs> that would be ghasban. <laughs> ghasban is without warning, when you rip the hair out, when you, you know, uh, tear the hair off of an animal's back, or you rip the hair violently off by grabbing it, which is an excruciatingly painful thing to do, right? That act is called ghasban. And what it's telling us, in, in, the, in its most hyperbolized form is, it's as if you've never experienced this kind of violent plucking, you don't even know what that is, until you see this king and his forces in action. Like they are the very definition of this kind of yanking. In other words, they were just taking ships, killing anybody in their path, and probably even enslaving the people on board the ship. You're coming with us too. The whole ship and its crew. Why do they have to expend, if they're gonna want the ships, then why are they going to expend money on the crew? Take the crew with you, turn them into slaves. So these, these young men were headed towards a hell of a life. And Allah Azza wa Jal allowed for that ship to get damaged so that this king doesn't grab a hold of it and ruin their life. And in doing so, Allah has taught us some profound, profound things. It might be that a setback and a damaged experience, a, a terrible experience will put you in difficulty. But definitely it might be that Allah will put you in difficulty to save you from a much bigger difficulty. That might be the case. But there are other questions. The other questions are, what about all the other ships? Because the ayah says, يَأْخُذُوا كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ And clearly Allah rescued this one ship. But definitely Allah did not rescue what? All the ships, there may be other masakin يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ And their ship got seized. There may be others who didn't get this favor that these young people got. And you know what? What did I tell you about the drop? Khadir has one drop, but there remains an entire what? Ocean. For them, saving their ship was the best thing for them. For some others, getting it seized was the best thing for them. These people have to experience this setback as a rahmah from Allah. Those people might have to experience a different kind of setback, getting taken, getting taken into that, that, that navy, and then going to war, and then ending up in a foreign place, or all of that, that must be the rahmah intended for them, that looks like a disaster. So it looks like a disaster, but it means something else. And Khadr doesn't have access to all the stories. He doesn't have access to all the timelines. He just has access to this, and even within this, Within just taking that one ship and damaging it, there are masakin on it. Not one, multiple. Each one of them has his own life, has his own family, maybe has his own children, maybe has his own parents. Isn't that one life and that one livelihood connected to multiple lives? Isn't there a lot more to this story? And maybe now that they don't have a, a way to work, they each have to go their own way and find their own rizq. Isn't this a more complex scenario? But Khadr السلام, has been only given what? The drop. He can only tell you about this part. Look, this one act of damaging, from what I know, from what I've been told, because the file is way too classified even for me, but the little bit of it that has been declassified to me is that there's a king coming to grab their ships and that's why they were saved. This is giving us a picture of how complex Allah's plan is. How complex it is and how we want it to be simple. We want the answers to be straightforward. Why did Allah do this? Allah Azza wa is taking into account every single drop in the ocean, not just that one drop. And even in this ayah, we're just getting a drop. We're not getting the entire ocean, even now. But at least we have some idea that everything that's happening and everything that's even beyond our control is actually part of a larger, much larger plan from Allah Azza wa there's another philosophical side of this that needs to be addressed. Is the king doing something just or unjust? The king is doing something unjust. The king is doing something unjust. And actually at face value, so is Khadr. Khadr damaging a ship is also doing something unjust. Human beings are only able to see justice and injustice in between one domino and the next domino. Like we can only see one immediate transaction or action as just or unjust. Allah Azza wa Jal sees the entire domino effect, all the multiple domino effects, 
and then decides what is not just or unjust, but what is rahma. Allah Azza wa did not create this world for justice, actually. There's a day that's coming that's meant for justice, which is what? Yawm ad-deen. The day of justice and judgment, perfect judgment. By definition, deen cannot exist here, not in perfect form. It can't. We, you, you and I know that already. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did more good in this world than any other human being possibly could. But he didn't get the rewards of it in this world. There's no way his good was done justice in this world. Fir'aun took many lives, killed many children, but he drowned how many times? He drowned once. And until that day, he lived in a castle. His drowning is nowhere near the justice that he deserves. Among other, declaring himself a god, trying to kill Allah's messenger. The list of his crimes is huge, but the physical, worldly punishment is very little. This world was not designed for justice. This world was designed in some way or the other for Allah's Rahmah. And Rahmah is a broader concept than justice. And Rahmah, the mercy and the loving care of Allah, might actually even look like injustice. It actually might look like injustice. This is the, this is the sophisticated view of the reality of this life that the Muslim develops. So the Muslim's faith does not get shaken when he or she sees injustice and says, where is Allah? How come Allah didn't intervene? How come Allah didn't provide justice? Because He didn't provide justice, I have a heart, my iman is shaken. No, it's not shaken. It's not shaken. Does it mean we accept injustice? That's the, la the second part of this complication. If, if you and I are alive and we have a chance to oppose that king, should we oppose that king or just say it's the qadr of Allah, this was part of Allah's plan? No, we're gonna oppose that king. If we have the ability to, we'll stand up to that king. Musa alayhi salam, when he saw a wrong happen, did he just stay quiet and say, this must be the qadr of Allah, I should just stay quiet, or did he question it? He questions it. He questions it. Because Allah did not create a believer to have sabr in the face of injustice. Musa alayhi salam was told with a guarantee, you cannot have sabr over this. Now, please understand this carefully. Musa alayhi salam is the role model for sabr. He had sabr to live under Fir'aun. He had sabr to see Banu Israel enslaved. He had sabr to travel in the middle of Madian in a desert. He had sabr to live away from his mother for 10, 12, 8 to 10 years away. He had sabr to come back and hear the insults and the kufr of Fir'aun. He had sabr to deal with the several years and to, you know, with the antagonism of the Pharaoh. He had the sabr to deal with the, the Israelites who questioned whether or not he's even a prophet. He had the sabr to deal with them and guide them even though they tried to kill him. Sabr, 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 sabr. And when he comes before Khadr alayhi salam, Khadr says, inna, alayhi salam says, inna ka lan ma'ya sabra, excuse me, I am Mr. Sabr. How do I not have sabr? The, how can I not have sabr? Musa alayhi salam not have sabr? Do you understand he's the prophet of Banu Israel? <laughs> That's a pretty sabr task job. Right? You have to have an enormous amount of sabr to deal with Banu Israel the way he dealt with them. So how come he didn't have sabr? Actually him not, in, not having sabr is not a aib is not a criticism of Musa salam. Actually, a believer in Allah is not supposed to have sabr over injustice. You're not supposed to say, oh, you know, you see, if Allah sent a flood or an earthquake or, you know, something out of our control, we, all we can do is sabr. But when a pharaoh is doing something wrong, I'm not going to say I'm just going to stay quiet and, and have sabr. I'm going to speak up against it. Musa salam did exactly what he was supposed to do. And that was not a aib. That was actually an acknowledgement by Khadr salam that you, because the kind of believer you are, aren't designed to have sabr over what you see as injustice. And from these ayat, we're not learning, oh, you shouldn't have sabr when you see injust when you see someone being killed or someone a ship being a people's da property being damaged. Just have sabr. Maybe it's one of those khadr assistants that did it. That's not what we're being taught. We're actually being taught to be like Musa alayhi salam, to be like him. And we're not supposed to have sabr in certain situations. That's why even Khadr alayhi salam said. When he met Musa salam, in the hadith he said, Allah has given you ilm la yambaghili. It's not suited for me. 
Allah has taught Musa something not suited for me. And then he said, وَعَلَّمَنِي مَا لَا يَنْبَغِيكَ And I, he has taught me, يَنْبَغِي لَكْ He's taught me what something doesn't suit you. It's not meant for you. That's not, that's knowledge is not meant for you. And he, uh, uh, Khadr is operating on a different revelation, different kind of instruction than Musa And we are on the side, we have to act in accordance with the revelations given to us by Allah Azzawajal, which is a continuation of what was given to Musa before him. Yes, it's five minutes. Yeah, I got it. Totally. Okay, so that's the, 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 the bottom line that I wanted to share with you about this ayah. That does not mean, last, just dis, uh, disclaimers. It does not mean that if you're going through a difficulty, it definitely means that Allah is saving you from a bigger problem. That may not be necessarily the case. But could it be the case? Yes. Could that be one reason? Absolutely. Could it actually be that you're going through a difficulty, but the benefit of that, the ease, will not come to you, will come to a generation after you? or come to some others after you, and that you might be an indirect beneficiary, that might be the case too, which is going to be the second story. The, the, the loss is going to happen, but the beneficiaries are later. Right? It's not direct beneficiaries. The other interesting thing here is, okay, the ship got damaged. The king comes, looks at the king's naval forces come, they look at the damaged ship, they don't have the time to fix it, because they got to go invade some other nation, right? So they just leave it alone. They leave it alone. And the fishermen who were so upset that their ship got damaged, just imagine if you were one of them at the beach, hiding behind the trees when the naval forces came. And they saw the damaged ship, they moved on. And they look at each other, yo, I'm not that upset that the ship got damaged. Are they upset anymore? No, imagine if it wasn't, didn't get damaged. Oh my God, Alhamdulillah, it got broken. May, they might not even know how they did it. Right? They might not even, and by the way, even if they know Khadr did it, let's imagine they know Khadr did it. They're like, it's a really good thing it got broken. And Khadr can't come back and say, by the way, you're welcome. No, 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 we still hate you. You still damaged our ship. How would you know? Right? But actually, they didn't know that Khadr Ali Sam, it seems like they didn't know that Khadr Ali Sam damaged the ship. So now, they now realize soon after that this was a good thing, right? So it may not be, and because wara'ahum means right behind them, so maybe hours later, minutes later, they realize that this was actually a good thing. So it could be that something bad happens to you, it looks like a bad thing, and not too long later, you realize that it's what? Okay. It's a good thing. You got a flat tire on the highway, you had to pull over to the side, and you're like an hour stuck, and then you get, get the news that 30 seconds ahead of you, there was a massive car accident, 20 cars crashed, a lot of people died, and you're like, that was the best flat tire of my life, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> you'll find out immediately that that was a good thing. But it may be that something bad happens and you never get to find out that it was a good thing, which is going to be the next unraveling, right? So the different scenarios are going to be unraveled before us. So I'll conclude with that now. Barakallahu li walakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. You can, you can... Or, or how do you address something that is a misconception maybe culturally that is not... I, th I think that um, we, we miss one of the, the steps in what we consider Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. Rasul before he was enjoining good and forbidding evil or calling out something that was wrong, before that he was, uh, ha had the most perfect manners. Like the, what people knew about him before anything else was that he is kind, respectful, courteous, merciful, loving, etc. So before you want to correct somebody about what they may be saying wrong or doing wrong or believing wrong, you want to build a kind of relationship where the other doesn't see you as someone who's talking down to them, but rather someone, you, you, you as a young person are seen as someone who respects them, who looks up to them, who acknowledges the good in them, and doesn't just see a fault. A lot of times we see someone praying the wrong way, all we see is this person is praying the wrong way. You don't see that this person is kind and charitable and takes care of his family and does a lot of good and made a lot of changes in their life, and you just see they're praying the wrong way. And you want to correct that they're praying the wrong way. Well, you, if you don't even get, take the time to get to know a person and to acknowledge the good in them, but the first thing you notice about them is what is wrong with them, and you want to quickly fix that, 
then that's how people will see, you wouldn't want to be seen that way. You don't want to be defined by what you're doing wrong. You want to be defined as a whole person. Well, why don't you and I learn to do that for others? Like see them as a person first, and then once you can give that, then maybe there may be a, a kind, gentle opportunity to bring up something that's wrong. And you don't even have to bring it up directly. You could even say, if somebody was praying the wrong way, you know what I learned about prayer the other day? I learned you're supposed to do this, this, and this. You don't even have to say, I noticed, by the way, that you prayed six rak'ah for maghrib. It's not six. I don't know where you get double trouble from. It's only three. You don't have to, you don't have to do that. You know what I learned the other day about maghrib? You could just come up with a you know, little scenario, make, make things, really? Where did you learn that? It was here. You want to see this video? You want to watch this? Can I send this to you? you might, I thought it was pretty cool. Make it about yourself. Don't make it about someone else and making them feel bad. Just make it about you. And that's, so, so gentleness and ra'fa and rahmah are part of the attributes of the Messenger that, that are particularly needed when Muslims are dealing with each other. Ruhama baynahum. Quran says they are loving and caring among each other. Even when they're correcting each other, it should apply, right? Ashidda al al kuffar, ruhama baynahum. Where's the ruhama baynahum? We have to bring that back, inshallah. A couple more questions. Uh, we have a question from the Sishu side. Okay. Sorry. There's a sister side, guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, yesterday you said something about five-year-old trios. Mm. Um, yeah. Isn't that a normal thing to do, though? Um, how, do you, how do you approach them? And um, is there any, any steps you do before Great question. Uh, phenomenal question. Phenomenal question. So fighting your curiosity. So by the way, human beings by design are curious creatures. And actually the progress that humanity has made in every field is a result of what? Curiosity. So curiosity in and of itself clearly is a massive blessing of Allah. So we shouldn't blanket discriminate against this, this inclination that we have of being curious as human beings. What I did say yesterday though was fight your curiosity. Let's talk about that specific context. Where must I fight my curiosity and how must I fight my curiosity? Here's the thing. I'll give you an analogy I gave a long time ago. I think it'll help with this. Imagine that there's a, uh, a professor that, that used to teach business, right? And he left the teaching and he went and started his own business became a multi-billionaire, extremely successful, the business is running on its own now, and he decides that he wants to come back and teach again, just because he wants to give back, right? So he wants to benefit young people from not only his professional teaching experience, but his real life business experience, right? And he loves teaching by way of telling a story. So he comes to the classroom and he tells the students a story about there's this man, he wants to sell shoes. He first looked at which location would be best to sell these shoes. He looked at the price point of these shoes and the median income of that neighborhood. He looked at the, the kind of marketing that's been effective in that neighborhood. He looked at the suppliers, the product. Basically, he's going through every component of the business side, but he's putting it in the form of what? a story, right? And that's easy for students to remember and remember the components that are involved in the making of a successful business. And he does a pretty darn good job at creating that story and addressing all of the elements that are needed for a successful business. And then a student raises his hand and he says, this, uh, this businessman that started a shoe store, how tall is he? And this other student raises his hand, I'm curious, so what color socks does he wear when he starts his business? And another one raises his hand, so when he started his business, what does he eat for lunch? I'm just curious. Now, can you tell there's something fundamentally wrong with that curiosity? What's wrong with it? The purpose of this lesson was to get you curious about supply, demand, location, marketing, quality of product. Bus the context is business. And in this context, all of your curiosities are guided towards the subject matter. Right? Now let me tell you, I, and these questions represent two things. When students ask these questions, it's two things. One, they are incredibly stupid. They, they miss the point entirely. And two, they are deliberately trying to distract from the real subject. They're trolling the teacher. 
You understand? Those are the two possibilities. You're so dense you miss the point entirely, or you're distracting the teacher from the real purpose. Now, Allah has a purpose in telling us a story, yes or no? Okay, Allah has a purpose in telling us a story. He tells us a, me a story about some young people who fled into a cave, right? Now my curiosity should be, why did they flee to a cave? What do I learn from it? What, what was the benefit of them going to sleep? Why did Allah Azza wa Jal give us this? They must have had so many conversations, why did Allah record only this part of the conversation? But if my curiosity was, was that dog a German Shepherd? Or was that a Chihuahua? <laughs> and if it was a dog, did it bark like a scary bark or did it have like a little ruff, ruff kind of... I want to know if Mufassirun addressed my curiosity. Do you see a problem with that kind of curiosity? It's missing what? It's missing the point. So we have to train ourselves when we're studying the Qur'an to, it's not, it's not hard, because the Qur'an is very clear about the point that it's making. That's not a heavy intellectual exercise. We can actually decipher what the point of the story is and then limit our curiosity to further benefit from the fundamental point. So let me tell you unhealthy curiosities about this story. Unhealthy curiosities could be, where is this beach? What kind of ship was it that it got damaged so easily? How many Masakin were there? 10, 12, 15, or 20? Who was this king? Was he French? Was he German? Was he Spanish? Because the Spaniards had a lot of ships, you know? When they worked in the sea, what kind of job did they have? Is it taking away from the point? Yeah, and if Musa السلام, had, by the way, before we go, I just have some other curiosities. It's not the case, right? So it's actually just to step back and one should, the, the way to address healthy curiosity is when you're, when you're learning Allah's religion, just take a step back and ask yourself one fundamental question. Is the answer to my question going to benefit me in my relationship with Allah? Is the answer to this question going to benefit me in my connection to Allah's words? Because the purpose of Allah's words, according to Allah, is remembering Him and getting counsel from Him. Counsel means advice. Mawidatun. And healing of some sort. Shifa'un lima fi sudur. Wa hudan wa rahmah. And it's guidance and it's mercy. So is my question going to enhance me in a counsel from Allah? Is it going to enhance me in my personal guidance? Is it going to enhance me in my remembrance and appreciation of Allah? If I start asking those fundamental questions, the kinds of curiosity that are unhealthy will start getting filtered out, isn't it? So, we, and we shouldn't lose sight of those fundamental questions that we should ask ourselves. Because the Qur'an is very clear about its purpose. Just like that business professor was clear about his purpose, but some students just didn't want to get it. Right? Great question, by the way. Yes. Yes, sir. It's not something you forget. And even in the hadith, right, the, on this, it even says like Musa and his fata, they, they, they saw the ajaba, right, when, the, when they looked at the fish. And so I've always struggled with the, the concept of forgetfulness, of how, how is it possible to forget? Really good question. So one possibility I have, and I wanted to get First, I understand how you think about it, but it, it reminds me of Adam and Hawa. And in Surah Taha, right there, there's hidden uh, in Adam, min qabalu, fanasiya. And they're only given one instruction. Right. So, is this maybe like the comparable thing? We gave you one instruction as a human being. Uh, and, and Adam had it, Musa has it, you have one instruction. Remember Allah, and you have all these signs around you, but still you forget, and so it's possible. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe if you could just help me understand. I think you have, you, you understand? I don't know, maybe if you could just help me understand. I think you, you're, you, your understanding is quite solid already. The idea that's being communicated in the forgetfulness component of the story is that you stopped at the right place, all the right signs occurred, you were so focused on this mission, you had no other task. Right? And yet they forgot. 
and in it is an embedded lesson that sometimes you are so focused on the task that you might even miss out on the task itself. <laughs> like, you know, I give my students the example, you're looking at the text like this. And you, you're like, I can't see anything. Because you got to what? Take a step, oh, oh, wow, how did I miss that? Because you were, you were too stressed, too focused, and that, you know, or, or too overwhelmed by a certain task, and that can make you forget. Uh, you know, some people, they get really nervous when they get pulled over by the police, you know that? Right? So co cops in the East Coast especially, you don't open the door if you get pulled over, right? And they know that, but they pull over, or some people start speeding extra, oh, astaghfirullah. And then the cops yelling at them, oh, astaghfirullah. And they're supposed to stop, but they're getting even worse because when you're stressed or you're overly, you have over, too much anxiety, then something so basic can, can slip because this, this is a human flaw. It seems that Musa salam wakes up and he's in such an uh, like in, uh, overwhelming, enthusiastic hurry to keep the journey going that he envelops his student Yusha ibn Noon in the same hurry and the, that major thing that happened kind of gets sidetracked. Even though you wouldn't, you, I can't imagine being sidetracked by that, but actually Allah is telling us that even a single instruction, something so fundamental, we human beings are very easily, uh, we, we easily fall into the trap of forgetfulness. But it's also interesting that uh, Yusha offered a rationale for why he forgot. He said, وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ إِلَّا شَيْطَانُ أَنْ Which is interesting. What did the devil have to do with him forgetting? Technically, he just got distracted, right? So what happens there is, you were given a task. And one hadith, I don't know which hadith narration you read, but the Bukhari narration, there's a couple of variations. One narration, uh, Yusha alayhi saw the, sh the, the fish you know, just take off, was about to wake up his teacher, and then decided that my teacher is so, so tired, I won't tell him yet, let him completely rest. Right, so he put off, his task. Now what he told his teacher, or he thought to himself that I should let Musa salam sleep, that in and of itself is a good thing, isn't it? You're being courteous to your teacher. But he compromised his obligation, which was a good, for another good that he considered. The devil may not just get you by telling you to do something bad. The devil might get you to forget your fundamental task, by keeping you busy with a secondary good task. Right, and that's actually one of the, the inclinations in this ayah. The secondary task became primary temporarily to Yusha alayhi salam. And that's, he, he realizes that's, that that's actually one of the tricks of shaitan. One of the ways to look at that trick of shaitan is that he got me busy with concern for you and then got me busy for going, you know, following you and the actual fundamental task slipped temporarily from me. Right? And he, so from it we might learn that we, for example, in this religion we have fara'id. Right? Salah is supposed to be prayed, kitab al in a certain time. Now while you're about to pray, there's some other opportunity to do some good deed, some da'wah to somebody. Or talk to somebody. Some, some, uh, a non-Muslim wants to ask about, I'll finish in a second. A non-Muslim wants to ask about Islam. You're like, this is a good time for me to talk to them. Oh, it's a good thing. But Salah has priority or no? It is, and you might end up talking to this person so long that Maghrib came in, you missed your Asr. Right? Because, and you left a better thing for still a good thing, and that might be a trick of shaitan too. Because nobody forgets Asr on purpose. Right? So that might be one of the embedded lessons Allah Ta'ala Adam inside of it. Jazakallah khairan. Okay, time's up, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, everybody. I'll stick around after Salah as long as I can. I'll be in the middle so I can have access to both... Uh, uh, our, our, our sons, daughters, and brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.